Hello everyone, this is Indigo Gaming, coming at you from Boston. This is the first day of PAX East. First thing off, we were invited to the behemoth uh, breakfast, media breakfast. So they had a bunch of coffee, uh, bagels. They have a really cool booth. They have a whole bunch of uh, interesting uh, arcade-like machines. They had like Amelian Hominid, they had Castle Crashers, uh, which I guess is getting an HD re-release, by the way. Uh, they had uh, Pit People, they had a Battle Block Theater, and each one of their arcade machines have like these custom uh, like pulleys and, and arcade controls and stuff. They put a lot of effort into their booth. They really have hats off to them. Um, I think I bought every one of their games. They're just really, really charming. Got a great art style and stuff like that. So I think they're doing a HD remaster for modern consoles for Castle Crashers, which was a uh, four player beat em up. So that seemed pretty cool. I got to see a little bit of that. I then got to see Earth Defense Force Iron Rain, which is. Uh, I'm actually a fairly new, I'm fairly new to the Earth Defense Force, uh, franchise. I've heard about it for years. First one I played, I think, was like, I think, 4.5 or 4. It was the PC Steam release, uh, a couple years ago. Had a lot of fun with that. The game's really, really janky, really, really not well optimized for the PC. Um, a lot of other issues, but it's also a whole lot of fun. Like, it's just... That's a, that's a great game, a great game uh, argument for why not, you know? A lot of games would have, you know, you'd add on these giant, you know, huge mountain tall monsters and, and rockets and unlimited jetpacks and things like that. And you'd add all those things in the game and, and some game designer would, you know, normally say, uh, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. Like, but EDF says like, no, add more, basically. There's just so many weird, uh, crazy, over-the-top um, guns and weapons. You can call in tanks from the sky, call in mechs from the sky, shoot at giant bugs, you can titans the size of skyscrapers, literally, and some insane, insane action you'll never see anywhere else. It's kind of all a little bit goofy and a little bit wonky at times, but it's a lot, lot of fun. I talked to some of the guys at uh, D3 Publishing, and they said that this new game has kind of uh, been retooled to attract a Western audience. Now, um, if you played the prior games, that may worry you. I could see that as well, but I think they did a lot of improvements. The UI is a lot better. The main menu is not godforsakenly cryptic and, and ancient. It looks at, uh, straight out of like a PS2 game. It actually looks fairly modern, looks pr fairly intuitive. The game handles a bit well, you know, it's all just a bit cleaner and a bit more attractive to, I think, the expectations of your average AAA, you know, uh, game player over in the West. So they're trying to kind of test the waters here. I think they're doing a console release on PS4 uh, to start off with. And I, I asked them point blank, hey, are you doing a PC version? Because, you know, PS4 version, I believe, was locked at 30 frames. And these games quite often tank their uh, frame rate based on the ridiculously large explosion and action that happens. So um, no plan, no concrete plans for PC version, but I think if the PS4 version does well, they'll probably consider PC. Um, they did do a PC version for, I think, Earth Defense 4.5 or whatever it was called. Um, so it's, 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 it's within the repertoire, but we'll see how it goes. Um, but yeah, I did enjoy it. I played a little bit of action. I think there's, there's like ant riders, I believe. Up to six players can play together now. I don't. I think it was four before, but maybe I think it's been bumped to the six. Uh, a lot more customization features and things like that. And yeah, just overall geared to be a bit more polished, accessible product. Which I mean, the games are great. They're a little always been a little wonky. I think up until the three six Xbox 360 version, they actually had 2D sprites for weapon pickups. It was kind of like ridiculous, but they uh, really kind of went for that kind of we don't really care about presentation let's just make this thing, thing ridiculous and over the top and and awesome and glorious and 
They've always succeeded in that, and so I hope they continue with Earth Defense Force Iron Rain. Um, got to play a little bit of Splitgate. If I were to pitch it, and they actually pitched it exactly like uh, I would, uh, Halo meets Portal. Um, I would actually argue it plays a little bit like Halo meets Unreal Tournament meets Portal. Kind of cool, competitive uh, shooter. Um, kind of like an arena shooter, yeah, more like an arena shooter. Uh, basically, it, I mean, it's got battle rifle like straight out of Halo. It's got some other kind of cool weapons like plasma rifles and things like that. Very, very similar to, um, you know, arena shooters like uh, Unreal Tournament kind of has that feel. But the whole cool mechanic it adds is portals. You get uh, Q&E by default on your PC is red and blue portal, essentially. Uh, one portal goes to the other. So at any point in time, you can drop a portal on one side and drop, and drop a portal on the other and jump through it, run through it, uh, or shoot through it. And you can see through it too. So that is straight out of the portal puzzle game, but bringing it into an action uh, atmosphere. It was kind of cool. I got to play a couple matches and essentially uh, there were some times where I was able to uh, kind of just to drop a portal here and then run down the hall further because I guess I was being followed and drop another portal and then I was able to get the drop on him through my previous portal and shoot through through the portal at him and stuff like that. And you can also do the typical stuff. It has a full physics engine so you can like create a portal uh, like down a drop. You can create a portal down there and create a portal somewhere else and then you, you jump into the portal and the, uh, the inertia and momentum is carried through so you can do some kind of cool jumps and tricks i'm sure we're going to see some insane videos uh with people doing cool tricks and stuff with that because that, that just has a lot of potential and potentially a very very high skill cap um i think because there's gonna be so many different weird uh techniques you could do i believe that's coming out in a few months uh like a beta um but yeah that, i was i was impressed with it. it seemed pretty cool it handled pretty well so yeah that could be quite good yeah, I was able to set traps and stuff like that. And you're also able to, like, sneak up behind people because they don't know you're there. Uh, this was pretty cool. It kind of came on my radar recently. Wrath Aeon of Ruin. Kind of a clunky name, but elevator pitch, it's Quake. Uh, Quake meets a little bit of Hexen, not too much. But um, it's it, it not really distinct as far as the kind of setting, per se. It's got kind of a quakey feel. It's got kind of like a little bit of, like, a medieval fantasy type feel. But um, you start with like this big, uh, kind of like a uh, arm blade that you can stab guys. There's a lot of melee in the beginning uh, that I played, the first level that I played. And what was cool is every weapon has an alt fire. So like your stab, your stab weapon, your alt fire is to rush and do like a charge stab, which is pretty cool. Um, then you get like a magnum, and the magnum's alt fire is like a, a charge, like three shot or whatever. Uh, shotgun, which actually was surprisingly uh, satisfying. Shotgun's alt charge was you actually, it's like a, a two barrel shotgun, which is really like a great sound, really clunk, you know, thump to a lot of weight behind it and everything like that. But uh, then what happens if you, if you charge it, basically you see your two shells in the back of your uh, shotgun flare up. Like you're, you're basically cooking your, your shotgun shells, which is actually pretty cool. And you, uh, you bl it is a wider shot and a, a spread shot and a more more damage I believe. Oh, there's some other guns. There's basically a nail gun. Uh, they call it I think the uh, the Fang Spitter or something like that. Uh, pretty fun. That one was pretty good, especially the alt fire, which instead of shooting at rapid fu rapid fangs, it shoots out slower um, double shots of fangs. So you can actually kind of uh, it's a automatic, but it's like more methodical and more accurate uh, fangs. So. Yeah, it was a, a, I had a lot of fun. It's got the kind of eerie, kind of ambient sound in the background. Not too much music. It's just kind of more of like a ambient experience, kind of like Quake was. Um, but it, it does have some music. I asked it. I was like, is there music in this game? And apparently there is. But in the demo I played, it was very ambient. Um, it's like secret areas where you can get extra ammo or pick collectibles or whatever. Uh, has that kind of... If you played Quake, you kind of know what I mean. Like, it's got that kind of fast, somewhat smooth, a somewhat slippery feel to it. Like, you can kind of slip off of rocks if you're not careful. Um, apparently, it actually uses the real Quake engine. I don't know if it's been used like a Windows port or whatever, but um, obviously it runs great. Uh, it's it's weird because it's it's it feels like an old Quake, you know, old school Quake game, but the animations and the presentation 
is all really really slick so like when you pick up a gun you like pick up the gun you like you tilt it over and look at it and inspect it it could do like your first pickup animation which is kind of cool but yeah, yeah the mechanics and the and the feel of the game feels just right for a new game but the uh it still has that old school spirit which is really cool i've seen a lot of games like that uh recently i, I played it for quite a bit um it gets challenging you know you, you have health pickups and everything like that and when you die you die you don't just regen so it was pretty pretty tough oh apparently some actual quake dev uh veterans were working in this game so like some of the guys who actually worked on quake were working in this game and they will uh be doing uh some sort of multiplayer deathmatch team deathmatch stuff like that down the road they're still figuring that out but yeah that seems to be a future so it seems like a basically a really solid quake successor that feels very similar it even has like the pixelated unfiltered graphics and stuff like that it definitely feels like quake but it doesn't it it, it, it looks it looks and has the heart of quake but it feels um modern in a good way you know it feels polished more polished than quake because quake was such a you know one of the very first solid fully 3d shooters so um let me check that out Another good uh, title I saw over there was Iron Maiden. I think that it's also a 3D Realms game. They basically took the build engine, which if you're not familiar with the build engine, that's the engine that they used for Duke Nukem 3D and Shadow Warrior, the original Shadow Warrior back in the day. Both really, really uh, excellent, fast-paced uh, first-person shooters back in the 90s. Still remember to this day downloading the Duke Nukem 3D demo over uh, 144k modem that was uh, that was a different time but um you know, the build engine uh it was actually it was interesting um the the technical differences are many uh between like say the doom engine and the build engine the doom engine actually was not a 3d engine it was a really clever technical trick where they basically it was a 2d uh top-down shooter that was presented in a pseudo 3d environment so because of that you could only have one plane of elevation. Um, even, even uh, like you had an elevator was just the same plane, just moved up or moved down. You could you could only have you could there are two settings: ceiling height and floor uh, height, essentially. So you couldn't have layers and layers and stuff. Duke Nukem 3D could. I remember actually designing levels in the build uh, editor back in the day. So it was a bit more advanced, a bit more level design was a lot more complicated. You know, you could do all that kind of stuff, but it did still have 2D sprites. And Iron Maiden uh, actually, I believe, uses an updated version of the build engine. So it's got all the same <laughs> limitations, stuff like that, but it does actually feel pretty good. Uh, the, I don't know, again, it may be kind of like the Wrath Aeon of Ruin kind of thing where they do an updated Windows version, but it is the build engine. I asked them about that. And to a, po to a fault, actually, like they're actually having issues setting up multiplayer because they have to actually add online multiplayer to the build engine. <laughs> which is like a 20 something year old engine at this point so it's actually kind of kind of cool how retro the, they've gone recently but um iron maiden very much like duke nukem i was actually surprised i'm more familiar with duke nukem 3d but the game plays more like shadow warrior uh the wo the weapon design and stuff like that feel kind of feels more like shadow warrior they even have like an uzi which reminds me of the, the uzi and shadow warrior the original game um so that's a kind of feel but it, has some interesting cool mechanics again it has uh i think it has like about 10 different weapons and uh which was fairly common back in the time you can have all of them at the same time and just switch between them as you will but it was kind of cool just like uh wrath and of ruin it has alt fires for each weapon so it, it gives a, each weapon a lot more versatility so for example the uh revolver you get early on you can just fire it like a revolver but if you hold down the right click um by default it actually goes into uh kind of like it's high noon, you know, in, in uh, Overwatch, like where you hold down and you, you're able to target multiple targets and let go and you just fire at all of them. It has that as its alt fire, which is pretty cool. I mean, that's a lot of, it's pretty advanced uh, design for an alt fire, actually. It has a lot of cool, uh, yeah, I mean, weapon design seems cool. It's got like a really fun uh, grenade launcher, it has various other um, expected things. I mean, it definitely plays like an old school uh, game. It has like, 
little remember the little kind of interactivity bits that were in um Duke Nukem 3D, like you could like tip strippers and things like that. It had, I don't know if you could tip strippers in this game, but uh, you can like use the jukebox, for example. You can turn on the jukebox, put a disc on, and, and hit play, you know, things like that. It has a little bit of little bit of sort of fun game design. And for example, at the level I was playing, it had a um, a working uh, kitchen lift, so you could actually climb into the kitchen lift, press a button, and like go up to the second floor and things like that. Like it was, you know, I was like working vents and things like that. Like the level design was just a lot more dense, a lot more interesting. In games like that before every game became just a, a, a very beautiful corridor for the most part so um yeah i, I like it a lot it, it, it has that kind of old school feel um they're both different i mean if you like quake more i think that wrath would be more your style if you liked like duke 3d more i think that ion, ion maiden would be more your style they're both really good i don't, I don't necessarily think one's necessarily better or worse than the other uh, quake obviously has the more 3d engine um, but they'll both look good in the end. Yeah, they even go down to like creating 2D sprites, 2D sprite weapons, 2D sprite enemies, everything. It's actually impressive how retro they went. You know, it was almost like a reminds me when they did um different company did a uh like say Shovel Knight where they went all you know all in on that kind of 8-bit retro NES style. There's something kind of wholesome about it. I don't know when they actually put all the limitations in place to make it as as authentic as possible. So yeah, I, I liked it a lot. Uh, I think they're trying to, they're kind of looking at what they're going to do with multiplayer. I think they're going to add co-op or, and, you know, TDM, deathmatch, stuff like that. Um, they're still working on it because like, like I said, they're actually working with the build engine. So they're actually having to kind of retrofit the build engine to work with modern online stuff. I remember, I think Duke 3D had some sort of online capability. It was kind of, I don't even know if it was GameSpy. I think it was, I remember 10 being a thing total entertainment network or something like that i think that was a thing back then and that was their connection i mean i remember playing doom over serial network um <clears throat> serial ports where you literally hook up a cable to one computer and to another computer before the invention of usbs to uh play like a direct connection uh multiplayer them that was fun back in the day but um no it seems really cool we're definitely retro re revival i mean I think that's probably 3D Realms like uh, saving grace at this point because they have that sort of old school talent, I guess, and old school kind of branding. So might as well capitalize on it. It seems pretty cool. So I'm looking forward to those. Another game I tried out was Devil's Hunt. It was kind of an unexpected one. This is by a small Polish company. Uh, published by 1C Entertainment. So this is uh, pretty cool. Got to play a short demo with some uh, group, couple groups of enemies, a few different powers, and uh, a short puzzle, and a boss fight. So I got a good, you know, vertical slice of the game, basically. Best I could describe it would be if Arkham Asylum and Devil May Cry had a baby. Basically, uh, you have a little bit of the free flow combat. You can, you know, dodge, parry, uh, block attacks, things like that. You know, hand-to-hand -hand combat, a little bit like Arkham Asylum, Arkham City, those kind of games. But then you have on top of that some pretty powerful uh, special moves. A ground pound that does a bunch of damage all around. You had a seeking ability where you spouted out fire from the ground. These are actually really, really powerful. And in some ways, kind of, because they're just in cooldowns, they kind of actually make the main hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat somewhat optional if you just want to spend more time on fights. So it was a, it was an interesting mix. I mean, it's going to be released, I think, Q3. So they've got you know half a year to polish it up and whatnot. I, I think the game looks great. It runs in a UE4, um, a little rough around the edges, especially in the animations. I think some of the animations didn't quite connect. There were some pretty rough transitions here and there and things like that. So obviously it's you know still early, still unpolished. But uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a really interesting looking game. It's a small, fairly small team for this kind of project game seems kind of like a fairly linear story driven affair i don't think there's going to be that many branching paths and stuff like i said there was like a puzzle or two um at least in the demo it made a puzzle completely optional you could skip it if you wanted to had a couple of kind of cool ideas uh had a sort of a mechanic where you could stand on a, on a, uh, a special platform and then look at another platform and teleport instantly to that platform to add a little bit of depth from you know traversing one point to another uh there was 
there's a I think going to be a th three different uh, main forms you can take, and I think a skill tree where you can unlock new abilities in each one. There was like a, a main form where you do fire abilities and punching and stuff like that. Then there's a demon form, which I got to play a little bit of that I believe in during the boss battle. I think there's another form as well. So it's it's going to have it's kind of like a somewhat like a spectacle fighter uh, Arkham. You know, style free flow brawler meets uh, a very, very, very light uh, action RPG. I don't know. It, 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 it was a little bit unclear as far as the, the depth of that, but I believe there is a uh, progression skill tree and whatnot, so there's a little bit of progression there. Um, has it definitely uh, smacks a little bit of Devil May Cry? Kind of looks like Dante. Kind of like more of the DMC Dante than, than the other ones, but it wasn't as, you know, annoying millennial as that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it, it definitely had some potential. Um, looking forward to it. It, it. it had some kind of, you know, Doom 2016 style demon takedowns and stuff like that. The powers had a lot of punch and impact. And if anything, I think the special abilities might be a little bit overpowered in the build I played. You know, it kind of, it kind of you now made the actual free flow combat optional. But then again, you know, I haven't played all the monsters. I don't know. If there are specific monster types that are, you know, those abilities are useless against, it's hard to say. But, you know, it definitely has a lot of potential there. Um, would like to see where they go. So, yeah, that was uh, Devil's Hunt, a uh, upcoming game, I think, Q3 2019. So, uh, check that out if that sounds interesting. Then I got to go and check The Sinking City, which is by Frogwares. Um, they are most famous for their long-running Sherlock series, uh, most notably their last two games, Sherlock Crimes and Punishments and Sherlock The Devil's Daughter, which I actually played and beat both of those. Um, actually, with my fiance. Uh, it was actually a fun, fun enough game to watch as to play. So when we were actually figuring out puzzles and things like that or figuring out clues and how they connected and who was actually guilty would actually sit down for like 20 minutes and just like go over all the clues again and again and say well if this is true this can't be true or you know he may be he may be a bad bad person but he didn't no clues specifically suggested that he's actually a murderer and sometimes they're actually pretty tricky like one of the one of the cases actually tripped us up completely we got it wrong so um very very good games if you like detective games i recommend those heartily uh, but they're actually, they're bringing some of those mechanics from the Sherlock games into the Cthulhu mythos. Um, it's, I don't know if it's, uh, Lovecraft proper, but it definitely has strong, strong references. Like, uh, I guess it's, it, I mean, it really is. It, they talk about in-mouthers and they're like fish people. So, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty on the nose with the Lovecraft references for sure. But it's, um. I don't know what I would describe it as. It, it has kind of a, almost like a little bit of, a, I hate to say it, but like a little bit of alone in the dark kind of feel um, with it's kind of being explory, uh, not too horror-y. They, they actually um, emphasize that it's not really a horror game. It's a psychological thriller. So I think they said there's maybe like one or two jump scares, which I actually like when games have a really good jump scare and you're not expecting it. I think those are the most effective. I mean, Bioshock Infinite being one of the most famous examples. Um, but uh, yeah, it's not going to be like a, oh my God, jump scare, zombies, whatever. It's going to be more kind of getting under your skin over time, you know, which I kind of like. I think that some of the best and most memorable uh, horror themed games like Silent Hill are more about getting under your skin and, you know, getting into your, your mind rather than just you reacting to something that's happened suddenly. So uh, yeah, I quite enjoyed uh, what I played of it. Uh, I think they gave you the first whole case to work out. Um, it's their first game to really have like proper action and combat. And I could tell, I talked to the marketing guy and he, he's like, yeah, it's kind of new. You know, it's their, they're kind of figuring that out. Um, it's like melee where you can like bash things and uh, gunplay. And I didn't play a lot of the combat. Um, it didn't seem particularly mind blowing, but it was a cool idea to add. And they have a full, um, I wouldn't call it an RPG, but it's got unlockable um it's got an unlockable skill tree and each skill tree thing has like uh from what i saw had a lot of passive bonuses you know useless ammo for shooting things like that you know different skill paths 
uh, hopefully I can show on the screen some of those uh, skill paths while I'm talking about it. But uh, yeah, no, I liked it. And it has a heavy emphasis on exploration and investigation, which are the two most arguably most important aspects of a Lovecraft game. I liked how, um, for example, the Call of Cthulhu game made by a um, completely different company last year uh, didn't have really have combat much at all, which was kind of cool. Um, I like the fact that it's kind of combat is like a last resort. And I actually mentioned that and the that really, uh, yeah, he really resonated with the, the Frogwares representative that I was talking to where he's like, yes, combat is last resort, basically. Like they're not gonna just throw you into a room full of monsters to shoot at every uh, waking moment. It's more about, oh, there's been the disappearance. Let's go look at this last place that they were, they were seen. Oh my God, there's like a something scrawled on the wall. Let me take a photo of it. Let me, uh, you know, talk to the other, you know, the policeman about it, ask him questions, you know, get some clues. Let me find which street crosses with other street on the map. And, you know, it's it's more about actual investigator, investigator work. I mean, the Call of Cthulhu RPG, for example, calls characters not characters but investigators like that was the actual name for their for their uh player characters so uh yeah it's, it seems like it has a lot of promise i'm really uh, digging the idea of it um it's got interspersed combat and stuff like that has uh choices and like for example one choice i could um i could talk to the guy get some clues and then i could compare the clues and come up con with conclusions and then most conclusions are are linear where like you know well uh, this person hates this clan of people and uh, he was ready to kill this person of that other clan so you kind of put those together and it's like okay this guy's got a, a motive and a likelihood of causing violence toward this other guy because he's part of a clan like that's a kind of a fact but then there's uh, clues that have ambiguous conclusions so like if this is true and this is true then either he was uh you know, intentionally trying to murder this guy, or he was actually under the influence of some, you know, some mental breakdown or, you know, supernatural element or whatever. So it lets you kind of, it's the mind palace uh, elements. If you're familiar with uh, Sherlock, the, you know, the TV show or Sherlock, uh, the games, they use the, the term mind palace, where essentially you take all these facts and kind of like, you know, churn them through and kind of come up with conclusions. And it's not, always linear like you can you can usually have two or more different outcomes and you get to decide what which one you believe but what's kind of cool is the the dialogue and and the the working inner workings of the system also for example i could have taken a bribe and then turned him into the police you know like i could have done a couple different things uh, in the demo so it was kind of kind of cool how you can kind of play with that and very morally gray it isn't black it isn't a you know, this is the absolute good decision. This is the absolute bad decision. It's all kind of like whatever works for you. And uh, yeah, some really striking character designs like the in-mouth mouthers were uh, like, they literally look like fish people to a point of almost almost a little bit comical, but it has a lot of weird kind of character to them. Like they, they actually talk about it. And like at one point your guy's like, uh, why do you look, uh, I've never seen anybody that look quite like you. <laughs> and then they're like, you know, and the guy uh, actually reacts kind of naturally. He's like, "Oh, you're gonna spit on me? You're gonna you're gonna call me names? You're gonna you know mock me or like you know, you know, fish face or whatever?" And so he kind of responds to you like as if he's been asked, he's been mocked about his his facial features and the, the fact that he looks like a fish, like for all his life, which is kind of funny. But yeah, they have a lot of interesting uh, political stuff. This particular city has like three major houses um in it and there's like the inns mouthers which are kind of like weird fish looking people there's this um i don't remember the name but there is this kind of house of uh run by like almost kind of like a, a mafia and they kind of almost look like apes a little bit and there's this other clan i didn't get to see many of those but looks like there's a lot of like you know strong factions and strong uh interesting stuff and it does have open world gameplay i don't know how tr how uh all encompassing all encompassing that's going to be I don't know if you're just like told to say, okay, you now you go over to this location and that location just happens to be open to you or if it's going to actually be really, really in-depth, uh, you know, more non-linear uh, gameplay. I, I'm not sure about that. I, I, I'd have to 
re research more into the game from what I played, it was fairly structured, you know, fairly linear gameplay, but I was never seemed to be physically restricted from going to most places within the vicinity. Obviously there were some, it was like a police barrier and things like that to kind of limit me somewhat, but it does seem like it kind of letting off the training wheels a little bit to kind of let you kind of breathe a little bit and kind of do other things. The Sherlock games were very, fairly narrow. So uh, it, w it is nice to have a little bit of extra, um, a little bit extra leeway to go for it. So that was cool. Uh, definitely, definitely feels, it looks and feels like Lovecraft. Uh, really looking forward to the game uh, by Frogwares, The Sinking City. So it's another big, big, you know, beautiful looking Lovecraft game. So. And uh, I wasn't able to go to the Gearbox presentation because I was only a half an hour early. Apparently people were in their line to go see the uh, big hullabaloo about uh, Borderlands 3 for two hours. And the, it, the lines cut off about an hour before it started. So I wanted to go see it. I was curious about what it was. I, I Not that it's a huge feat, but I was a day one purchaser of Borderlands. I actually pre-ordered it. I I was like one of the early, early adopters before it kind of blew up. Not many people remember it because it had a very quiet uh, lead up to the game. But once it actually blew up within like the first year, everybody played it. But yeah, I was a big, big fan of the idea of a looter shooter back in the day. So I'm kind of an old school fan, I guess you could say. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm I'm skeptically hopeful of a new game. I, I, I think they'll do... I mean, they have the formula down really pat, so I mean, it's kind of hard to screw it up at this point, but I'm just hesitant because it's been so long. You know, we have uh, higher expectations. I mean, when you look at Destiny, when you look at, um, you know, The Division, when you look at all these other, you know, Shadow Warrior 2, all these other games that kind of taken that kind of looter shooter concept and ran with it and arguably better in a lot of ways. Uh, Borderlands always succeeded. I think it still hasn't been surpassed in, in terms of just the sheer scope of weapons you know the the amount of weapons and the variability of weapons is just insane but the actual handling of the weapons i think uh, has been surpassed greatly by other games but i, I we will see i hope they've learned from other games and kind of take it to the next level i just i know v a lot of the people that worked on borderlands 2 in very key positions are now not working at gearbox anymore so we'll see how it goes and it is new generation so the new challenges but i wish them the best i hope that borderlands 3 is awesome um, played Gato Roboto, <laughs> which I don't know whether if it's. I think it's still in development, so I don't know when it's going to be released. But Gato, it's a, a digital devolver game. Um, they make some really, they uh, publish some really weird and quirky games, and I pretty much love them all. Um, this game is 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 kind of like it reminds me of the the presentation reminds me of Minute, which I think was another. I believe that was a devolver game as well. Uh, it was all black and white, like literally 100% white, 100% black, you know, pixel art. And it seems like that would be eye gouging, but it's actually kind of charming in a way. Um, probably saves the graphics budget by a huge amount too. But whereas Minute was kind of like a miniature take on Zelda, you know, a lot of people compared it to Zelda's Awakening. Um, in this case, Gato Roboto is uh, Metroid. Metroid, uh, very much so. So, it was cute. you play this cute little cat and gonna run around and like go through, you know, tight areas and stuff like that. And occasionally you can go into a suit and I believe other things too. And you gain new abilities when you're in your suit. So, let's say, uh, you know, you get like rockets and, and more powerful weapons, things like that. And so it's got this kind of different things. It even has like a spin, a jump spin attack, uh, I don't know if it's actually an attack, but you can jump, spin, and things like that. So it's got a lot of kind of Metroid tropes and things like that. It kind of has a Metroid-ish design, boss battles, things like that. Definitely a uh, game to keep your eye on, too. Kind of stylish, uh, Metroid-esque platformer with cats, you know? Thursday's probably going to be quieter than the other games, so I try to get a lot of games done. But I'm going to try to get to see some other... Uh, titles i have some scheduled um exclusive times to play these games and yeah we'll see what happens and uh oh i also got to meet one of my viewers there uh he happened to be going uh 
two packs for a day, and we met up. It's uh, Jason the Unpopular. If you've recognized the name off of one of my streams, got to meet him. So that was pretty cool. Kind of an unofficial fan meetup of one <laughs> one viewer. But uh, th hey, Jason, thanks for meeting me, and I, I appreciate you uh, reaching out. And yeah, it was a lot of fun. Been a blast. I was up until about 6 a.m. Uh, the night before I uh, left for Boston. Um, getting my last video ready and it's now ready so yeah it's been quite a quite a few couple of few days <laughs> really tired but I'm looking forward to what's happening next so I'll see you uh, tomorrow day two was a bit of a disaster uh, about halfway through the day my foot started to swell pretty bad and I had to go to the clinic to get that checked out and it was a uh, long story short, infection, swelling, whatever, and had to get that uh, treated. But I completed the day and got some more things done. So it was a shorter day, so let me run through that. Um, so on Friday, we went and saw Divinity Fallen Heroes, which is an interesting, uh, it's kind of like a standalone spinoff. It's a collaboration between Larian Studios and another developer, I forget the name now, but they are cooperatively developing it. It's, um, it's a follow-up uh, in terms of storyline to Divinity Original Sin 2 but it's more of a tactical reinterpretation of the game. It, it, the combat is very similar to Divinity Original Sin 2, but the emphasis is more on the combat rather than the, you know, uh, dialogue, non, you know, social skills, things like that. So it's more, um, I mean, you can do some preparation, stuff like that. You can choose your items, your squads, what kind of armies, you know, units are bringing, your commander is and stuff like that. So it's got, almost got a little bit of like an XCOM, uh, deal with it uh but you know in between missions but then the missions are purely combat so it's a different direction for the game um i'm not sure why they why they did this direction but it, i played a bit of it and it was good and it was very difficult it was you want tough you know challenging missions that require you know deep strategy and things like that i think that divinity fallen heroes is is has got something there for you guys and it's got the really excellent physics and uh combat system of divinity original sin and Sin 2, so that's something. We got to check out those guys, talk to them for a while. It's pretty cool. So I got to play some of this uh, indie game by Inti Crates. If you're not familiar with them, they've done uh, several kind of retro style games, including the Bloodstained Curse of the Moon game, which I actually streamed, uh, I think last year, I believe. Really, really great uh, Japanese based studio. They do a lot of kind of NES uh, retro style retro games. With a, with a smack of modern polish, but it, it kind of really feels like the kind of NES hard games. I really, really enjoyed uh, Bloodstained uh, Curse of the Moon. So uh, this new game, Blaster Master Zero Two, is actually kind of interesting. It's actually like a direct, they got the rights to this old NES game, I believe, called Blaster Master, and then they uh, that did well, and so they're, they're doing like a direct sequel to that. Um, it's got some kind of interesting elements. I don't know. It's got a platformer sequence where you're in this little um, car where you can aim around and shoot at enemies and, and leap. It even has fall damage. Fall damage is actually a big deal. Whenever you leap too far, you actually take fall damage. You have to be careful about that. But you can also hop out of the little um, the little vehicle and go on foot to fit through certain areas that are too uh, slender or too narrow for the uh, car to go into. And those include also caves. And I was surprised to find that when you leave the vehicle and go into a cave as, as a little guy on foot you actually go into like a completely different game mode kind of like almost well i immediately thought of smash tv if that's an old reference and that you don't get it that's fine but it was kind of a top down it was kind of like one of the earliest twin stick shooters even though it didn't have sticks or or two of them at the beginning you know but it was yeah i mean you, you get a room you know usually a static non-scrolling room full of guys you have to clear them out go to the next room clear them out and stuff like that so it has a couple of different elements going Pretty cool. I think it's a. Uh, I think it's starting out as a uh, Nintendo Switch exclusive, but they do say that if it does well, they're gonna look at other options and other ports and things like that. Got to meet the lead developer and the creator of Brigador, which is a game I've actually been wanting to cover for a while. Um, I just kind of walked by and it's like, oh, Brigador, and then I saw the guy. I'm like, wait, that's Hugh Monahan. So I got to see Hugh Monahan, and if he's not you know, really well known, but I, I read an article about him a couple years ago talking about how he spent like five years making Brigador. It was like a real huge pra passion project. It was at least five years, if, if not more. And uh, yeah, I got a one-on-one -on -one on him and he was really uh, very, it, it, no BS kind of like really, 
he was obviously telling you the truth and telling you what, exactly what he felt at every point in time, which is actually rare, especially as you go up into you know budgets and AAA and stuff like that. People usually kind of give you a very filtered version of what they actually think. But now it's really cool to actually talk to a developer one on one and talk about his trials and you know things he he thought he did well, things he thought he did badly, and you know actually he was quite uh, I had to use the self word self critical, but he was very constructively critical of, you know, what he had done and what he hadn't done. And Brigador is kind of a... My instant uh, impression of it was kind of a semi-cyberpunk-themed Desert Strike. If you ever played Desert Strike for the uh, SNES, uh, the Genesis, or the... Uh, I think later on they did uh, Jungle Strike and stuff for the PlayStation 1. Uh, you should have a vehicle you can kind of turn around and destroy buildings, destroy enemies, and, and they're very kind of sandbox missions like you can usually destroy all the buildings destroy all the walls take out enemies and there's always tons of objectives some of them optional Brigador is kind of like a reinterpretation of that uh, idea um, but what was cool is he was actually for the first time before he was actually announced it uh, officially I asked him if it was okay if I you know mentioned it but he's actually working on a direct follow-up to Brigador called Brigador Killers which is a uh, kind of a, a more tightening and focusing of Brigador. Basically, they're doing adding more visual effects, cleaning up the you know some loose ends and things like that, adding dynamic lighting and whatnot. Uh, but also, Brigador, uh, like he said that it, one of, some of his feedback that he got that really kind of hit him hard was like the great, great, awesome concept tech demo, right? But where's the game? And he obviously knows that there was a game there, but uh, he got the idea that. People liked the core gameplay loop of Brigador, but there wasn't really a campaign or a driving storyline or something that kind of pushed you further. It was just kind of like, oh, I'll start a match and play around a bit and have some fun and sandbox and that's it. So he's keeping he's keeping the fun sandbox gameplay and the things that worked with Brigador, but he's actually adding uh, missions and storylines and some sort of context for what you're doing, which I think is actually pretty cool. and. It really uh, good for a developer, especially um, in his state, state, to actually like recognize that that's that's something that people want. So I got to see him. Really cool talking to him, and uh, yeah, hopefully he gets to uh, do Brigador Killers, and that's a big hit and all that. So yeah, it's been a, I think over five years, possibly seven years or whatever. Just I spent his life making that game, so it's a real passion project, and it's awesome to see that kind of you know dedication to your your dream from people. So. Uh, so this other game is a Korean developed game that's being translated and brought to the US. It's called Mistover. And um, really cool people there at the booth. Um, they, it, you look at it and you're like, wow, that looks like Darkest Dungeon. So it's pretty obvious the artistic inspirations of the game. And there's definitely some gameplay inspirations of Darkest Dungeon as well. But you peel it back, you do see some pretty unique things in there. Uh, it the, the game is wrapped in a uh, roguelike uh, dungeon style. So if you're not familiar with that, that's the where you move uh, one square at a time and everything else on the map moves one when you move. Uh, permadeath, you know, randomly generated maps, all that kind of stuff. That's the roguelike formula. So in this game, there's actually a roguelike dungeon where there's uh, you move you move around, you know, there's obstacles you can break. I think breaking obstacles takes a little bit of your health. Uh, there's like, you know, poison slicks and various other elements there's a lighting system and there's a food system if you run out of food you start taking damage if you consume food over time you heal up slowly over over each move there's also uh, the lighting system also affects uh various other mechanics and chances and things like that uh there's keys and chests and whatnot so there's a lot, a lot of things in the overworld right but that's kind of the dressing for the combat which is uh you get into the combat it definitely has some darkest dungeon influence but it's interesting in that instead of just having a row of four characters like in Darkest Dungeon, it actually has a three by three grid. And your placement also all of a sudden becomes uh, really important because there's spells that affect uh, certain rows, there's spells that affect certain columns, and uh, also there's uh, introduction of combo abilities. So if you have a, a, cre a character like next to another character that they have an ability with, they can then do a combo ability and does this kind of like anime style, uh, you know, two close up faces on the side and they do this kind of cool, awesome effect and deal a bunch of damage or do some other effect or whatever. And um, there's various characters and classes. And I believe they said that that you the more you play, you uh, I think every week or every uh, so many levels you complete, you unlock new characters, which you can then play in future playthroughs. 
And each character uh, has different abilities, obviously, in combat. There's like a healer, there was like a paladin, <clears throat> a uh, uh, some sort of witch or, or wizard type character, um, and a thief. I might be missing a couple. But they have in combat abilities and specials and combos and whatnot, but they also have uh, roguelite dungeon or roguelike dungeon abilities as well. So, like, for example, the thief. While you're moving, if you see a monster, um, and there's some monsters that are very aggressive and they'll chase after you as soon as they see you, those are the monsters that are uh, more, you know, they might just go their own business, they don't really pay attention to you. So there's different types of monsters. You don't see exactly what monster you fight, you see the aggression style. So you see like a red eyes if it's aggressive, blue eyes if, it, if it's docile. Um, but if you don't want to engage that, that uh, monster, you can use the thief's kind of overworld ability, which is to basically go invisible for up five whole turns or something like that, right? Uh, I believe the, the healer had a, an overworld ability that um, recovered life over the next 10 moves or something like that. Um, there's various other abilities. And the, so the, the characters not only affect your uh, combat, you know, moves and stuff like that, but also how can get you out of jams in the overworld, which I thought was kind of a cool twist. And I think it'll be interesting, completely randomly generated, uh, you know, maps and things like that, multiple levels and... You know, it's very one of those games that can be very, very replayable, and it has a pretty good uh, system. When I played combat, I, I had you know a lot of fun. It was was pretty engaging, you know, tactical things like that. So they didn't just take Darkest Dungeon and re you know rebrand it. They actually kind of did some new things. Uh, they mentioned Disgaea as a um, as an influence. Definitely not as a complex as Disgaea, but I could at least kind of see the appeal as a little bit more of a JRPG look and feel to it. Uh, you know, elevator pitch, Darkest Dungeon meets JRPG, uh, meets roguelike game. So that seems interesting. I definitely check it out. It's missed over. Um, okay, so that was on Friday. That was a pretty light day because uh, didn't get much done because I was at the clinic and walking back and forth on my my hurting <laughs> foot. <laughs> Today. I was able to get in and play Biomutant, which is being uh, published by THQ Nordic. Actually, a really cool game. The story behind it is that actually some big shots at Avalanche Games, the guys who did uh, Just Cause, um, Mad Max, obviously, those kind of games, they decided, hey, I love games, I love making games, but I, I'm in, you know, a kind of chief officer position and I'm not really making games anymore. So they kind of left and started a new company and then they those guys went on and made uh, Biomutant, which you've probably seen some promo for. It's, it's got these kind of weird, like, looking like cat raccoon creatures and stuff like that. And there's, like, some of them, like, pirate patches and swords and stuff like that. And you're like, what? what is this game? It took me a while to kind of get the game. Um, it had a, a limited, time-limited demo, but I think I got a kind of rough outline of it. But it's uh, pretty interesting. They throw you kind of, in the demo, they kind of throw you right into it. But uh, there was a combat, which... I was, it, it kind of felt like a shooter at first, but I was like, I was shooting the guy and I'm like, oh, I'm not really doing much damage, but I can move freely while I'm doing it. So I'm like, okay, I'm getting a little bit of a DMC, kind of a Devil May Cry vibe from this. But then I realized that, oh, uh, I can actually hit him pretty hard. So yeah, a little bit of Devil May Cry, but then, oh, when I fight a group of guys, I actually see little icons pop up above their head when they're about to strike me. So, that, and that indicated that Oh, this is kind of free flow combat, kind of like uh, Batman Arkham Asylum, Arkham City, things like that. I can actually, you know, parry and, and dodge and things like that. So it's got a little mix of combat there. Uh, pretty, pretty fun, pretty fast paced. You dodge, roll, shoot, reload, um, shoot in the air. Uh, it has a kind of an auto targeting system for your shooting, which is kind of cool. Really cool thing, though, at the beginning of the game, you get to make your own little creature. And you get to, like, uh, there's, I don't know, there's a diagram. It's almost like a. Uh, like a polygon diagram or like a pentagram, uh, pentagon diagram or whatever, um, and you can you can ascend to each point. You know, you if you go to like all the way to strength and vitality, you're like l really low on intelligence and uh, some other ability. And so like there's like a trade off, and you can be right dead in the center, or you can go into the extremes. Right? We've seen that in various games. Like the only game that came to mind immediately was, um, I believe. Uh, Secret of Mana had a, had a little, I think, an AI thing like that where you move it to one corner or whatever. Oh, um, Tokyo Jungle and other games have that, had that sort of system. It's a way of showing bars in a fancy way. But what's really cool is that all of your physical features change when you set your character stats. 
So if you have a very uh, strength or vitality oriented um, creature, they'll be uh, look more brutish and and you know kind of strong and things like that. They'll they'll all their their physiological features will actually shift depending on what their uh, particular mutation is and w what they're good at and whatever. So it's a kind of cool th feature of the game. You can also choose your the pattern of you know fur you have, what kind of fur you know, thick or thin fur, whatever, and you can also choose the colors and stuff like that. So you have a little customizable, and it somewhat reflects the your character's abilities. Yeah, there's a lot of combat in the game. There was a couple really weird but interesting mechanics. Uh, you, you get uh, mutations over time, uh, some combat mutations, some traversal mutations, things like that. Um, I got this one thing where I was able to, like, create a almost like a big ball of mucus around me and I was able to bounce like a big bubble and actually stick guys onto the bubble and then pop it and stuff like that. You're able to fight these big brutish guys and and you know there, there's a lot of a lot of little interesting mechanics like that. Um the character will kinda like retch and kind of evolve and, and learn some new ability or whatever. And in the in the demo was fairly linear, but um apparently in the in the final game you your mutations are kind of lock off a certain other mutation. So uh, he said that there, uh, this, the representative I was talking to said that there was basically three paths of uh, mutations. There's organic mutations, cybernetic mutations, which are kind of like, you know, metal, you know, robot arms and things like that. And, uh, sort of like a, I don't remember the exact word that you used, but you talked about electricity and other kind of energy powers and stuff like that. So looks like you can kind of evolve in different directions, but like say organic mutations block off cybernetic mutations and vice versa. So there's a bit of a, uh, you know, you're going to carve out a kind of unique path of evolution in your in your character. And, you know, it's, it's basically a skill tree. Long story short, but it, it make it kind of interesting and thematic and, and your character is actually altered permanently because of it. So kind of interesting, a little bit fable that way, but I wouldn't I wouldn't really make that comparison very much uh, to that game. But that's uh, the lore and the, the it has a very kind of subtle world building about it. It's kind of like a post apocalyptic world that's not really earth not really anything it doesn't really describe the world or just define what it was or what it is but you kind of hear tidbits and stuff like that people talk about oh yeah with the the apocalypse or whatever or whatever happened and you know it, it, you kind of discover a little bits about the world as you play which is kind of cool there's like weird kind of mutant squirrels and things like that different languages so it's, it seems like I have a lot of really uh, interesting lore and and fiction underneath the surface that you can kind of dig into and kind of pick apart and and grab little bits of uh, interesting world building from here and there so i kind of like that i i found that entertaining but yeah by mutant definitely one to keep an eye on i think that uh that had some interesting ideas a lot of like meet different mutant animal tribes there's like big mutants that you have to like you know de watch out as they charge and stuff like that you gain extra abilities i got this like you know special punch move where i could charge up and punch enemies or punch down doors and stuff like that so it's got a lot of ideas going for it it's pretty uh pretty creative interesting game after biomutant i made my way over in the same booth actually because thq nordic actually bought warhorse studios I uh, was talking and I was like, yeah, you guys at THQ were doing so great. You bought Warhorse. And then Toby and Rick from uh, Warhorse Studios were like, yeah, Warhorse. And they, they called us over and we uh, chatted with them, the two um, PR marketing guys at uh, Warhorse Studios. I actually remember uh, seeing Toby's posts and stuff like that and Daniel Vavra's posts and stuff like that about Kingdom Come and Deliverance, if you're not familiar with them. They're well, probably one of the biggest over and done with Kickstarter successes, I'd say. Uh, they raised... A lot of money in Kickstarter, but then they managed to turn that into like an acquisition by THU Nordic, and they've done great. They've sold millions of copies, you know, the really, really popular, successful game. And it came out of nothing. I mean, they, it's been a passion project for years. And even uh, uh, Toby and Rick were talking about the bumps and, and various challenges they had making a game of that scope and that scale and that presentation level with such a small team, you know. I think they're, they're all Czech Republic based, I believe, and uh, Prague, I believe. And, um, I mean, it was it was a rough thing. Like the making a game like that, cutting edge uh, graphics. I th still think it's one of the best looking games out there right now. Cutting edge graphics, you know, shoestring budget, you know, high levels of production, 
uh, voice acting, you know, open world, uh, RPG, in-depth mechanics, CryEngine. Like, it was, a, it was a tough, it was a tough beat, but I didn't manage to put it together. But enough about them. I am a Patreon backer, or uh, sorry, a Kickstarter backer, just FYI, full disclosure, but... I think they did pretty good with what they what they got, and they've been doing a lot of DLCs. We got to see a little bit of their new DLC, which is called A Woman's Lot. And they did something interesting with that. They created a new... Uh, well, it's actually one of the characters in the main game's uh, campaign. Uh, Teresa, I believe it was. And she is introduced to Henry, the main character of the game, a c- couple points in the story. But this DLC basically fills in the blanks of where she was in between. You know, she actually gets to see... Henry's village from afar when like you know bad things are happening and all this other stuff like if you play the game for like the first four hours you know what I'm talking about but um some really really interesting uh kind of parallel storytelling where it's actually telling events that are happening alongside of the main campaign so that's a pretty cool idea there and uh they also take on the the idea I love I love how they do this like even Henry who actually was like a, a blacksmith's son or I, I believe that's what he was uh, blacksmith's son he doesn't know how to use weapons at the beginning he sucks at sword fighting so he actually, actually to, he actually has to learn Teresa's the same way she's not no good at sword fighting so she actually has, she actually has to use other skills and other you know methods to defeat enemies when when it comes or just avoid them she's a bit more stealthy I think she can actually like backstab people and stuff like that but the kind of star feature of a woman's lot is the addition of a dog character and I believe the dog was named Tinker uh, she has a dog and it's actually a, a uh, companion that you can actually send out and like kind of aggro and he'll like attack and bite enemies and, and kind of keep them busy while you can come up and like stab them or do whatever. Or you can also, you can do other things with them, but yeah, the dog is kind of a companion that can level up. You can add to its stats and stuff like that. And it has sort of a meter called obedience, which is if you uh, basically, if you pet it, if you give it food and you, you do good things with the, with the dog, his obedience will go up and he'll be happy and you'll follow you around and do things like that. But if he gets hurt a lot, if you hurt him, if enemies hurt him a lot and he gets like a, kind of abused, his obedience will go down and he'll uh, run away and he won't come back for quite a while. So he'll eventually come back and you can like pet him and, you know, good boy, give him food or whatever. And what's cool about that is I think Teresa's campaign is about four or five hours long. That's what uh, Toby at Warhorse was saying. And uh, it looks pretty solid. Looks like it's got a lot of interesting uh, parallel storytelling, like I said, but also the... Uh, cool thing is that once you play the woman, a woman's lot uh, DLC, I don't think you even have to beat it. I think if you just play it, that unlocks a potential dog to play as with Henry in the main game. So woman's lot is like a separate kind of more limited campaign on the side that's kind of finite. But Henry's campaign, you can do all sorts of open world activities and all that kind of stuff, right? So what's cool is that um, a different dog, I think his name's Mutt, I believe. It will be available in uh, Henry's campaign once that's done. So you actually be able to uh, get an, your dog with the level up features and all those mechanics in, into Henry's game. Which that's a pretty cool idea. Uh, another addition is they added another quest, actually a longer quest, to Henry's storyline, which is about a sort of a a woman who starts to get like premonitions, like she starts to see like you know, oh the devil's gonna kill so and so or whatever, and then. Uh, Henry goes out and then finds somebody being killed by somebody with a, a shield with like a devil sign on it or something like that. You know, it's like some sort of interpretation of her dreams. And so she's not necessarily a bad person, but because of her visions and because of, her, you know, superstitions and stuff like that, she's branded as a heretic. And it's up to Henry to kind of, you know, navigate, you know, prove her innocence or whatever, or navigate that. And there's different ways that could play out. I think that was about a 10 hour DLC or whatever. So there's, a, there's two storylines, one with Henry, one with uh, Teresa, um, and an additional dog companion character. And I believe the asking price was about 10 bucks, but I think he said that all uh, Kickstarter backers, because it was this uh, woman character in the game was promised into the Kickstarter, he'll actually give this DLC to Kickstarter backers for free, which is actually really cool. They don't have to do that. I mean, this is years after the, the uh, game was launched but i think that's pretty cool that they're actually holding to their promises so that's that'll be out uh i believe in june if i'm if i recall a couple months so yeah not, not too far away
And yeah, I got after that, I got to go to a panel with Outer Worlds. So they actually had, I think had the lead designer, um, lead narrative, Tim Kane and Leonard Barsky. People have worked on uh, Pillars of Eternity, uh, Fallout New Vegas, like a lot of really, you know, hardcore uh, RPG enthusiasts slash designers and developers. I think the, the lead designer is a guy who's worked at Obsidian for 12 years. So, I mean, it's a good team with them. And uh, Tim Kane actually mentioned that of his team with the Outer Worlds, uh, about one third of them he's he's worked with previously. So he's got a really kind of good team, solid team that's that knows each other, that knows w how each other work and stuff like that. And he's worked with literally Tim Kane and, and Leonard Barowski worked together, uh, I believe, either earlier or the very their very first project was Fallout One back in '97. So they have a long history with each other. You know they. Did Fallout 1, they were, did a lot of Fallout 2 before leaving. They, Fallout 2 was actually about half complete, I believe. A lot of the story and everything like that was done before they left and formed Troika. At that point, Interplay was getting a little bit more corporate, a little bit more marketing driven, and kind of a little bit down the, the downward spiral that ended up, you know, kind of eliminating the company for the most part. It's still around, but it's not, it's a husk of its, you know, former glory. But uh, obviously, Tim Kane. Leonard Barsky and Jason Anderson went on to form Troika, which made three games that were all amazing, all flawed, but amazing games. Obviously, Arcanum, Temple of Elemental Evil, and Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. And everybody, they introduced everybody on the panel. And when they called it, I was like, Fallout. Everybody was like, you know, screaming, yelling, whatever. And then, you know, they mentioned Arcanum. There's a little bit of a cheer, which I was like, come on, Arcanum was great. And then Temple of Elemental Evil, mild cheer. And then Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, you know, crowd went wild. It's probably even bigger than Fallout, which is actually kind of crazy. But um, no, really, really good people. Uh, Leonard Barsky is a creative director. He does the art and uh, oversees the art production and everything like that. And he, you know, helps the story and stuff like that. And they kind of have this almost like a, uh, a radio show or like a little like banter between them because they always t say that Leonard is the dark, moody, depressing <laughs> guy. And Tim is the funny, you know, upbeat guy. I believe they both have that, but it seems like uh, Tim leans more toward the uplifting stuff, and then Leonard Barsky leans more toward the you know dark, somber stuff like that. But I mean, as we've seen in, in the original Fallout games, in particular, and uh, also uh, they weren't involved in New Vegas, but you know, you can see in that the reinterpretation of the old Fallout games, the mix of black humor and just kind of like upbeat themes with really decrepit, horrible, depressing putrid undertones it's actually that makes those games kind of really super interesting and fun and, and you know you might be laughing while you accidentally like shoot a guy in the groin and he like says you know ow is that how you get your jollies or whatever or you know the next moment you might be in this like horribly you know atmospheric you know cavern and running from you know mutants and stuff like that i'm a huge fallout fan obviously so people are very much interested in the outer worlds and um as many of you probably would uh, would bring up at first, they actually preemptively brought up the the whole Epic uh, Game Store exclusive thing. It's an uncomfortable subject because I know if they had it, I mean, it's obvious if they were, if those developers and the publishers and everything put their game on Steam, they intended to sell it on Steam. And there's no question about that. The problem is that um, the publisher decided that, or the publisher and Epic Games came to a, an agreement where Epic Games would give them some undisclosed money and the game, I believe, is exclusive for a year or something like that on the Epic Games Store. Maybe it's just exclusive forever, but I think it was like a year or whatever. Uh, and so it, you know, it's pulled from the Steam page. Obviously no chance for it to go on GOG. It's gonna be an Epic Games exclusive for a while. And as we all know, I mean, I don't have any huge beef with Epic, but you know, they don't have the Epic Game Store has not had the beaten down, you know, it's a, it's a road much less traveled. I mean, last time I looked in there, they had a dedicated coupon, uh, like a coupon code kind of thing or referral code for Fortnite in the checkout screen, no matter what you're buying. So that's how narrow their focus has been so far. They're a Fortnite machine. They may have like 90 million active users, but a good 70 or 80 of those are Fortnite players. You know, it's, it's a very, it's misleading to think that they have that many users when that many users are for one game. You know what I mean? Like Steam has a, such a, a, a huge plethora of games that it's it's a much more well-trodden uh, games platform at this point. And they've, they've gotten refunds and various other aspects down a lot better over time. You know, not necessarily 
due to their just being, hey, let's be consumer friendly. Valve has gotten knocked around a bit, but because they've gotten knocked around a little bit, they kind of know what they're doing a bit better, I think. So I can understand, especially when people are excited for getting something on a platform they enjoy or, or like and being pulled, bad thing. Uh, that being said, it was the publisher's decision um, and not, it wasn't uh, Obsidian pulling a, a fast one. It was absolutely, uh, I believe, uh, Division, Private Division, I think it was. Uh, I believe Private Division, I think that's the name of the, co- of the company, is a subsidiary of 2K Games. They made that decision, they made that call. So, I mean, in the end, the game will probably get a bit more money funding, which is good, but yeah, it's going to disappoint some people who are looking to play that on Steam. That being said, the game actually looks pretty damn good. So um, they actually did a live demo with the lead designer, I believe, uh, actually playing the game right in front of us on a big, you know, uh, projector screen, which is pretty cool. And we got to see some of Byzantium, which is like the main, like the primo city of the colonies that, that they're in. Basically, it's bit and pieces of story, but they mentioned that basically there's like tens of thousands of people frozen and shipped out to these outer worlds colonies a couple different planets and stuff like that and byzantium is the prime city that's supposed to be awesome to live at and everything like that and if you go there you get to see it's not all green grass and daisies there either a lot of interesting deep lore as you'd expect from great uh, talent like tim kane and, and Leonard Barowski. there's like propaganda there's movie posters there's a lot of like, little in-game literature and stuff like that and i was so happy they actually addressed it during the q a that they will be following the rule that they followed in fallout in that they have references i think they mentioned there's a couple like uh, uh like minor references to futurama and other and other you know media whatever but it's very mild and it they follow the rule that if if the reference is if you realize it's a reference and you don't get the reference that that's too much that's too hard of reference like it has to be subtle enough that you get the joke uh without knowing the reference you know that was the rule that original fallout did fallout 2 kind of went a little bit too far i think um leonard and and tim kane weren't involved in the latter half of fallout 2 i love fallout 2 i think it's great but yeah i did think it went too far in the in the references and and you know goofy uh jokes and in jokes and things the setting is kind of interesting it's got kind of a little bit of buck rogers space suits they've got even like the shrink ray you know classic sci-fi kind of feel to it it definitely looks and feels like uh boyarski tim kane kind of obsidian game like it's got the animations and the way the dialogue and stuff is presented kind of feels like Fallout New Vegas, a little bit like uh, Bloodlines, you know, kind of has the same similar animation stuff. It's hard to describe, but they did a pretty good job of that. It's, it's you know, it's mostly just like fairly mundane animations with lip syncing and stuff like that. But I'd say it's an improvement over something like Fallout New Vegas for sure, which isn't saying a whole lot, but I think it's, it's these things not going to be crazy good, you know, subtle animations is something like, you know, Witcher, but I think it'll, it'll, it'll be fine and won't be distracting or anything. One thing I know that one thing I'll note is actually I thought it was pretty cool when you're talking to somebody you kind of see kind of like we're almost exactly how I am on the screen somebody right in front of your uh, face looking straight at you but when you're when you're uh, when your companion says something you actually see him from the side looking at you like this so it's actually like you looking at them like turning your head to the left or turning your head to the right looking at the at the companion which i thought was a kind of cool detail you get that the sense of uh space where you're like okay i'm looking left to this character i'm looking to the right to this character so it's a kind of cool detail that i noticed in the dialogue and everybody's killable 100 uh everybody can die which is great they uh did a bunch of quests and then uh tim and and uh leonard and the lead designer i can't forget his name but the lead designer they all started saying like Eh, let's kill everybody and they started just murdering absolutely everybody in this in this town just absolute brutality you know they had this one weapon that you could um it actually was inspired by a glitch where they could bash somebody uh with this weapon every time they bashed him uh their body part would like expand or retract so you'd like hit him one time on the head and they'd like get big head mode and stuff like that very weird like there's a whole lore behind it whatever there was, they had a shrink ray, which I hadn't seen um, in the, this demo, but they mentioned that as well. There's science weapons, which have a lot of weird effects like that. Uh, of each kind of category, there's melee science weapons, long range science weapons, etc. Um, yeah, a lot of raw gameplay. The game looks pretty solid as it is. Combat was a li- like a. It looked bad. It was a little bit stiff, a little bit stiff, but it looked fine, you know? has a sort of, it doesn't seem to have vats or anything like that where you pause the gameplay. It has a slow-mo feature, which I think is probably a bit better, a bit more 
a bit less gamey, I guess, you know, it just kind of, they have a whole uh, lore behind it. You're basically like slowing down time using this, like, you know, time distortion field or whatever. And you can kind of slow down time almost a little bit like, uh, what was that game? Um, fear kind of like that kind of felt like fear a little bit where you slow down time, shoot guys and aim for the things they don't have like a aim at your groin or aim at your whatever by default, but you, they do. I saw it. If you shot somebody in the leg, it would slow them down or kind of cripple them. They do have uh, body part specific effects when you shoot at people. So that was actually a, it's nice to see that return. Um, I saw a couple things where you can actually, you can actually instigate combat with your, with your companions. Like they sent this one companion out to like, just, he would just run up and like jump kick somebody in the head <laughs> whenever he started the combat. Um, sometimes you will see like cinematic death animations, like this one person using like a laser minigun and just like shredding somebody to like bits and they'd actually vaporize and stuff after like this. Some pretty, some pretty fun, uh, polish and bits like that. So they, they're obviously no... What people liked about New Vegas and and uh, Fall Games and things like that. Um, everybody can die in the game. Your companions by default do not, but at a higher uh, skill level, higher difficulty, they do die. So you do have that option if you want to play really hardcore. Um, there's Q and A uh, panel. A lot of questions were asked. Anything from like cosplay to uh, God knows what. But one relevant question that a lot of people are going to have is mod support. No mod support planned. Uh, I don't know what engine they're using, but this is the first time they're being using it. And they said that it's right now they're looking to make a good solid game. They love the idea of, uh, of modding, but they can't promise any modding support at this point in time. Same goes to DLC and monetization. They can't comment. So I don't think they're going to be doing like, you know, microtransaction packs right at the gate, it's, you know, single player game, but We'll see. I think it'll be premium and they'll probably have some DLC down the road, but that's just speculation. It didn't confirm anything like that. I just wanted to say that uh, I've been a fan of, I love all your games, but particularly Leon and Tim, I've played your game, pretty much all your games going back 20 years. First one was the Fallout Junk Town demo, if you remember that, back in 97. Yeah. Like, it was oh, back. yeah, that was on, like, on a magazine, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for all your games. Uh, I just wanted to ask, what do you think your most important or most uh, influential design decision in all your games and your careers would be? For, you mean cumulatively or individually? Um, individually, if you want. I'd say probably the most important thing I ever came up with was making Fallout uh, post-apocalyptic 50s as opposed to what we were originally doing, which was just kind of a Road Warrior ripoff. Because um, that totally changed the whole direction of what we were doing, and it, it really, it's funny because it wasn't, it encapsulated what we were kind of already trying to do subconsciously. I think it just brought it to the forefront. Um, I have no idea where that came from, but that I think was kind of uh, defined it. That and the fact that Tim made me uh, use the blue and yellow for the vault suit, so we can <laughs> spot him walking around uh, conventions. I think actually, um, I mean, perks and things like that seem so common now, but. Nothing really had them back then, and we put that in. Um, it wasn't in the original design, and we put it in because people said, well, there's not enough to buy when you go up a level. And now it's not only in every game, but when the third edition of D&D came out, somebody from WotC said, hey, we really loved Fallout, and we got this idea for feats from it. And I was like, feats came from perks? You know, and I'm like, that never imagined in a million years something like that would happen. But... And I love that people still love Fallout. I mean, it's been 22 years since that game came out. And, you know, how many Fallout vault dwellers did we pass A just lot. this morning? Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really nice to see. Thank you. But yeah, I got to ask a question at the panel during the Q&A and ask them what their most important design decision or the most innovative design decision was in their entire career. Um, and they answered... Uh, Leon answered uh, that he thought that him deciding not to do a generic uh, Mad Max style post-apocalypse for Fallout, but to go uh, 1950s retro with it, really opened a lot of doors and made it like a really unique and, and valuable and interesting setting. It wasn't just like a recreation of something that was already existing, but he actually created like a really interesting, unique feel and world building for the setting, which is pretty cool. And then Tim, I believe I put this in my Vault video, uh, back in 2017, but um, 
he confirmed it. I didn't ask him this question, but he confirmed it basically. His answer to what his most innovative or his most impactful uh, game design decision was was perks. I mean, I believe uh, I believe Chris Taylor was also working on this as well, but he was kind of over that whole area. But um, yeah, perks and Fallout was actually uh, not really in the game initially. They initially just kind of based it off of GURPS, and then GURPS kind of uh, Steve Jackson games kind of like backed out of it because the game was too violent. And so they pulled the GURPS uh, data out of the game, but simultaneously said so like, hey, how about we add perks? You know, let's add to something that every few levels you get something that's like a cool little stylized lore based bonus that is a specific thing, you know? And people love that. You know, I, I still love the idea of perks. I think perks are great, and uh, especially in Fallout, they're very funny. They're very, some of them are just like, this is this is not even that useful, but it's hilarious. Like there's like, you know, I think, uh, I was it sex bird or something like that. There was like, you know, <laughs> When it comes to uh, the bed, you wrote the book or something like that. You know, a lot of little weird, a little weird, uh, you know, perks and stuff like that. But he said that uh, that was actually such a, an influential thing that years later, Dungeons and Dragons third edition was being written. And somebody from Wizards of the Coast actually called him and said, hey, people loved your idea from Fallout, you know, that you guys idea from Fallout uh, so much that we're actually making feats. So feats in D&D 3.0 was actually directly inspired by by Fallout Perks, which actually is crazy. I mean, that's that's actually coming from Tim Kane's mouth, so I tend to believe him. He seems to be a pretty trustworthy guy, so that's pretty awesome. I think that's a pretty big deal when he actually like influenced the essentially the <laughs> essentially the the game that invented the RPG. You know, kind of insane, right? Uh, that was Outer Worlds. I think it's going to be a pretty cool game. Um, Store exclusivity aside, I think that I think people are going to be finding a lot uh, to love in that game, and it's going to kind of fill the gap of a wholesome kind of deep RPG like that. So cool. I uh, got to play a game called Witchstone. I'm not really on my radar until I came to PAX, but it's made by the guys who did the stories Path of Destinies. I actually bought that game, uh, played a little bit. It had a really cool idea. It was basically trying to do dynamic storytelling where your decisions and your actions and choices kind of affected the storyline and kind of created a storyline around you. Um, they made another game, which I had not played um, in the meantime, but now they're making a new game called Witchstone. I guess they've been working on it since August, but uh, they've had a pretty quick turnaround. I got to look at a demo and play a bit of the demo, and one of the uh, guys at the studio walked me through it, and it was actually really interesting. It's uh, I love the concept behind it. It's uh, basically they create a world with different factions and and towns and cities and NPCs and give them all like, schedules and they get up in the morning they do this they go back to you know bed they go back to their house they have wants and desires create this whole world around you and then they let they give you all the tools to mess with it and screw with it give you a perspective on the gameplay it's kind of like a divinity original sin light basically I'll, I'll I'll put it out there CRPG you know overhead camera turn based combat. Uh, more Divinity Original Sin than, say, Baldur's Gate, because Baldur's Gate had the real-time combat system. Not incredibly complex. It has a couple cool ideas. You can have certain abilities where, like, if you attack somebody, you get, like, a pop-up with a uh, a timed add-on effect. So almost like a QT to add on extra things to that attack to kind of give you keep you engaged so you're, you know, not quite as distant, just, like, clicking kind of aimlessly couple other abilities and things like that so it, lo it looks definitely like a like a solid combat system but the really really interesting thing about this game is all the things you can do with the npcs and with the factions there's different factions in the world and reputations and things like that, that you can gain or lose with them and you can do quests with people do quests for a certain faction they'll, they'll increase your reputation with them and you can join them and each character in that faction actually has a rank so you actually see like the a faction lieutenant they have like little uh bar you know chevrons or bars above their heads the factions are at war with each other so they'll, they'll try to have conflicts and stuff with each other but the things you can do with this game is actually really kind of cutting edge like uh there's like a generic uh request maker and i immediately asked and yeah he definitely confirmed the ui in this game is very very unfinished it's very early he said that they've done two games previously they can do ui they can polish later but they wanted to do the really risky AI game overall gameplay elements first before polishing. You could basically tell somebody, uh, say, I want you to defend this town or defend this house uh, or attack this person or attack this house or join my party. 
you know, any any ma major named character, you can actually ask to ha have him join your party, and you do a, a persuasion check. And it's got a dice roll and everything like that. If you roll high enough versus all their dislikes and stuff like that, they'll do it. You can actually convince a dude to just go, hey, see that guy over there? Go kill him. And if you're convincing enough, he'll go and try to do it. Every item you steal or acquire, you know, through illicit means or whatever is labeled, and it has an owner. So one thing that this guy at the studio showed me was that if you go into, say, like this guy's house, steal some uh, equipment, you actually find out that he's actually a thief. And if you go to his house at night, he's not there. He's out stealing stuff. There's another little tidbit, but irrelevant. If you steal some of his stuff, you now have the stuff and it, and it shows it's owned by, you know, say Bob the Thief. Let's just give him a stupid name. Um, if you then go into this other faction building, sneak in and, you know, assassinate their leader and leave Bob the Thief's gear behind there and sneak out and you're not detected, that faction will then register that Bob the Thief committed the crime. You can actually plant evidence and turn people against each other. You can uh, do, uh, you can turn whole factions against each other, like Game of Thrones style. He mentioned Game of Thrones a few times as far as like the intrigue and politics and stuff like that. Uh, you can, uh, if you kill somebody and they have friends or family attached to them, those friends or family will actually come by and like seek you out later to get revenge. And lots of cool dynamic storytelling elements like that. They're really trying to get that sort of uh, dynamic storytelling uh, aspect into the games, making it your own story. Very much about emergent storytelling in this game. So you got factions, you got, you know, betrayals, you've got, you can uh, order people to, you know, you can try to convince people to like wage war on another faction. Randomly, after taking a quest from a blacksmith, he also just randomly uh, requested him to join his party. And it wasn't like a pre-written script button where you click, I want to, you know, join my party. He actually did like a custom, almost like a custom persuasion command to him. And so it seems like that will be uh, available to almost every single NPC in the world. Uh, cities can also get, you know, decrepit if, you know, in a bad way. They can get brighter and shinier and more populated if they're doing well, or de more decrepit if they're doing badly, or completely destroyed, depending on what you do. Uh, whole big world to explore. A lot of different things to do with it. So, yeah, I mean... It seems like there's going to be a lot of really cool elements to it. Obviously, it's a little bit early right now. Um, I think they're looking at getting, they're getting a publisher or Kickstarter at some point. Um, I I think they're a little bit hesitant about doing a Kickstarter right now. So yeah, they they're kind of you know they're seeing what they what, what options they have as far as the funding the rest of the game. But it already seems really really promising. I'm a little bit concerned about the writing. Uh, you know, the writing seemed a little a, a tad bit generic from what I saw. I don't know if it's placeholder writing or not. There was definitely a kind of a setting there. The setting kind of seemed interesting. They had like witch stones and technology powered by magic and various other elements and things like that. I just don't know if the actual storytelling text will be as compelling as it needs to be to get people to grip people. But that's something that could be addressed on the road. And I think they're working on more overarching mechanics at this point. So very excited to see what they do. I, I love the idea that the games are kind of head this way where they get out of the pre-written, pre-determined paths for you to, to follow and more into uh, sandbox. Like, I mean, that world gets thrown around a lot, but basically non-linear gameplay. So I'd like to see more of that. So that seems to be definitely a game to keep an eye on to see how well it does. So I got to play some of the Forgotten City. Uh, There's a famous mod for Skyrim that this was based on. Nick was actually, I think, an Australian developer who worked on a Skyrim mod. And it was very popular, very well-liked. But at some point, he realized, hey, 
this has got kind of a limit to it. I can't really do much with a with a Skyrim mod. I mean, it's limited by the Skyrim engine. You know, can't sell. I can't do it. Anything like that. So he's like, "How about I make this flesh out into a really kind of complete full game?" And so I got to actually try that out. Um, running Unreal Engine four, you know, looks just as good as any AAA game. Really uh, top notch presentation. Kind of different. Like it's not, not not your immersive sim RPG type game. I would say it's very much like a sort of immersive first person puzzle adventure game with dialogue and eventual combat options not your typical rpg action hack and slash at all but it was very very interesting here's the elevator pitch as best as i can understand it basically uh you wake up somebody wakes you up and you said like hey you know you've washed ashore are you okay whatever but i'm oh my god my brother went into these old ruins and hasn't come back after after all, an entire day i i know you're like recovering but you know this woman is asking if you can you can help him because she saved your life and you're like okay and so you walk over there and it's like these kind of weird kind of roman ruins and you go over there and you walk in and then uh in this kind of archway doorway and you find yourself into this different time of day different time entirely and there are these i don't know I didn't get as far as I really know what they were. They were like modern type characters in this sort of ancient ruined city. And they all had different personalities or in quirks and stuff like that. Some of them were kind of LARPing as Romans. Some of them weren't. Um, kind of weird, but they all, you also see all these weird, creepy golden statues of people everywhere. And they're very, very articulately uh, detailed. But basically, you're trying to figure out the mystery of the city and you find out that Everybody in the city is going to die horribly, <laughs> and it's an eventuality. But here's the twist: you just went through like sort of a time, a time. Uh, you, you travel through time basically, and you're now in a time loop. So the eventuality is like no matter what happens in this world, you know, like bad things are going to happen in this world. You can go back and restart the day. But here's the thing: you can't escape. You have to restart the day again and again and again until you figure this out. And you actually get kind of almost like a... It kind of gave me a little bit of mist vibe where you have the thoughts of previous people traveling, but you don't, hear, you don't see them. You just hear their journal you know, thoughts and things like that. Apparently, the, the designer, the lead developer, didn't actually ever play mist, so it's kind of a coincidence, but it reminded me a little bit of that. It got a kind of a mist vibe a little bit. Um, but I definitely have some potential. Um, kind of like a Groundhog's Day uh, repeating, you know, edge of tomorrow, kind of repeating day, kind of figure out how you can do uh, this world, how you can fix this world, how you can do it better. And apparently it's driven other people mad and they just like end up killing themselves because they can't do it and they can't figure it out. But there's a mystery behind the city and, and what it holds. And there's something with this, this, this gold, these golden statues. There's some sort of impending danger that's going, always going to happen. And, and you can't, you can't stop the, 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 the destruction and the, the death and the, the, tragedy is about to happen so it's kind of like a you figure out how to uncover the secrets and how to how to stop this from happening basically again and again and again very interesting concept um i think it has a lot of potential it's a very early build so i did run into a couple bugs a couple issues here and there um but uh apparently the guy was like working around the clock to get this build ready for packs um i think it's one of the first times it's been shown so Obviously, it's got a lot of things to work on and things like that, but I think it has a ton of potential. And for those who liked the mod, for people to go check that out if they like the kind of immersive storytelling. And, and it definitely feels like it has a lot of interesting hidden aspects. Like the more times you go back, like you learn things and your, your memory and your dialogue and stuff is persistent, but there's their characters are wiped, but there's more dialogue you can get out of them. So like... I went in there first time and he said, you know, oh, remember to follow all the rules and, you know, the, except for, especially the golden rule, you know, and, uh, you do all stuff like that. And I, I did something really bad. And then I went back to the entrance, restarted and I talked to the guy again. He's like, Hey, you, you know, you're not from around here. And I'm like, let me guess, you're going to tell me about the golden rule. Right. And he's like, Oh, was I really that drunk? And he's like, yeah, you know? And so you kind of, you have a persistent memory, but they don't. So there's a lot of little interesting aspects like that. So I think that is a very interesting... I can't think of many other games that have done that. So it's a very interesting, uh, unique take on uh, on a game like that. So I'm definitely down for checking it out. And uh, 
seeing how they do that. I think they're aiming for this year at some point for a release. So that's for the Forgotten City. You want to check that out? No! The many shall suffer run. for the sins of the one. Tell him why you're poking around in that temple there. You what? Nah. I've never seen you before in my life. Played an indie game called Disjunction. Cool little game, uh, pixel art. They actually gave me the pitch of Hotline Miami meets uh, Deus Ex, which I thought I was like, I, I'm sold, right? Played it a bit, it's pretty good. Um, it's sort of like uh, you're in your apartment, you know, listen to some messages, you go out, and then there's like you take a tram or whatever, and there's kind of like uh, Blade Runner esque music playing in the background, and you get to this area, and you're basically told that, okay, you have this job, you know, do take out, the, might need to get this data data chip or whatever, and, and get back to me. Dialogue, story, and stuff like that's pretty cool. Obviously, has a you know interesting cyberpunk world setting and everything like that. And then you get into the game, and it's it's kind of interesting. It's a uh, it's not like a top-down tank controls, kind of like Hotline Miami. It's more like uh, you press down, you move down, you press right, you move right, you press up, you move up. But you also have a, a freeform mouse movement, which lets you aim at different things. And there's, you know, melee combat. There's stealth mechanics where you, like, if you hold on sneak, you'll see people's uh, vision cones and things like that. You can do uh, sneak attacks, kill people, shoot them. You can alert other guards and they'll come after you. So there's a lot of different things at play. Uh, but what's kind of cool is that it has sort of like a, a fast-paced action element, kind of like Hotline Miami, but it also has a stealth element. So you can kind of do total stealth, total sneak, total ghost mode, or you can do a more fast-paced action mode, or you can do a combination of both. I played a, a level or two, and it was actually quite a lot of fun. Looking forward to it, I think it'll be an interesting addition to the kind of indie um, stealth action game genre. And yeah, it, pretty good elevator pitches. Hotline Miami meets... Um, it's like very, very uh, fast. Like you can die pretty quickly in the combat. It's pretty brutal, um, but you can also just avoid everything. There's a couple, you know, vision cones can't see through boxes. And there's like these uh, robots who would, uh, you know, see, th they would see in like patterns so that they kind of rotate their, their eyes essentially. So you could kind of learn to, uh, you basically learn to know when their eyes are going to look at you when they're not going to look at you. So there's a lot of different patterns, a lot of different bits of death. There's also uh, active abilities. So you could, um, you know, use smoke grenades to blind them for a bit, come in and take them out. You could, uh, yeah, there's all these other abilities and gun reloading, things like that. So it has a lot of, a lot of things to it, a lot of more, you know, complexities. And so it's like a tactical action game. So yeah, uh, I recommend checking out Distunction if that looks interesting to you. So definitely uh, look at that one. Uh, last one of the day, I saw Warsaw, another game heavily inspired by Darkest Dungeon, basically. it's uh, But this one is actually very gritty, very down to earth, actually set during, I think, 1944, in the last stages of World War II, where the uh, Polish forces, uh, there's like a Polish uprising against the, uh, the Nazi invasion, basically. And so you get to play these like... Um, Polish renegades kind of fighting like a kind of unwinnable battle essentially a sense, uh, against the regime that's coming in you kind of see this overworld and there's like encounters where you can either like try to scavenge for supplies or fight you know a enemy troop or whatever and depending on your your effectiveness the overall uprising will be like raised or lowered essentially it almost seems like it'll be lowered every time uh, but the worse you do it'll be lowered faster so it's you kind of mentioned like uh, the guy I talked to at the at the booth actually kind of mentioned how it was they kind of studied history and kind of looked at like uprisings never never particularly successful they just basically buy you time and that was kind of a really gritty kind of very stark way of looking at it but it's just kind of true um, I mean it was basically buying time for somebody else to kind of come in and take them out but 
Um, looks like an interesting twist on it. Uh, again, it, it, it borrows a lot of inspiration from Dark Ascension, the art style, you know, very obviously inspired from it. it has like the kind of pop up zoom in characters when they take damage and things like that. The combat system does have some interesting ideas to it, though. Instead of having uh, just a like a four slot row, like in, in Dark Ascension, it actually has like a uh, kind of a alternating, like almost like a zigzag uh, set of slots. And characters can be in those slots, but also obstacles can be in those slots. So you can, for, exa for example, put one of your guys behind cover and you'd receive uh, evasion bonuses and things like that. Just kind of cool uh, different abilities. There's like a medic, there's uh, different types of shooters. Um, a lot of shooting, obviously, because it has, has to do with guns, so I don't think there'll be as much melee, per se, but a uh, very interesting twist on the on the kind of game, and yeah, it seems like it has a lot of potential. Uh, I believe it's coming out this year as well, that's their plan at least, and uh, what, kind of, what kind of interested me was the kind of it's stylized, obviously, very stylized, and uh, I don't know that history as much, but they said that the, these are from Polish developers that live and live, actually live in Warsaw, so they actually managed to get city plans dating back from like 1930s to 1944 of the actual archived city plans of Warsaw and built the game around those war those plans. They actually treat the subject matter pretty seriously. Like as we know, there, there's a, there's tons of Polish developers, you know, anything from CD Projekt Red to the guys that made Runer to like, you know, I think two or three of the other games I've played are also Polish as well. It, one of the games like Devil's Hunt was also a Polish company. Um, there's very few games about Poland weirdly enough. So they decided to like kind of change that with this game called Warsaw. So very bleak, very gritty, um, has some sort of in between, uh, mission elements and stuff like that, but it's definitely a lot more, uh, kind of grounded, you know, stylized, but realistic kind of more down to earth grounded wars, ugly kind of stuff. So, uh, may have big appeal, may not, uh, if you like kind of history, you know, history stuff, that could be pretty cool. I definitely think it has a lot of potential. Very polished, very, very plays very well. Full tutorial and everything like that, and add some new mechanics. So if you're itching for some more uh, RPG, you know, kind of like dungeon delver, but in real in real life events, kind of inspired events, I definitely recommend Warsaw. It seems like pretty pretty cool game. So check that out. But that was uh, Saturday, and yeah, as I'm talking now, I'm about to hit the sack after a long day, and gonna get ready for the final day Sunday so hopefully we get some uh, some good things done then the final day of PAX we survived um, painful my foot was swollen but we got through it and did a couple more things and then just chilled out in the tabletop section for the rest of the day so I went and saw team 17's uh, games so there's a game called monster sanctuary which is apparently made by one guy uh, really cool um, indie pixel art game. It's if you had to do a basic pitch for it, I'd say it's like a Metroidvania meets Pokemon. So it's like a side scroller. You see all the pixel art from the side. You do jumps and things like that, get into platforms. But when you run into monsters, you don't fight them in real time. It actually starts like a whole combat. And what's really cool is that you uh, you start out with your familiar, your first monster. I think you can pick like one of th three or one of four monsters and name them. And they'll be kind of your guide and your and your basic creature throughout the game, but as you fight more monsters, you'll be able to recruit them to your your party, which can be grown up to I think six people at a time or six monsters at a time, and it's pretty cool. Uh, it has like very Pokemon esque mechanics. You know, you've got your strong against, weak against, different elements, things like that. So I was like, you know, I was using a leaf attack with my frog on guys that are weak against leaf. They do double damage and. Really interesting, kind of cool idea, different twist in the, on the genre, and yeah, I mean, the, the kind of eternal urge to level up and continue to increase your monster's power and explore and do other things, and I, I believe it, I, uh, there's eventually some extra abilities to gain access to new areas, you know, a la Metroid, so there's that kind of, you know, progression, and you can also gain items to equip your monsters, too, so it's got that little extra level of uh, customization and progression there so it's a really cool game I'm really looking forward to it. it's got a really great art style aesthetic you know pretty much a one one guy uh show so it's pretty pretty impressive how much people are able to do these days so that's a uh, monster sanctuary being uh, published by team 17 uh i didn't get a release date on that i believe it was supposed to be this year but uh, i saw that there was like the last couple tiers of of uh upgrades on on creatures and whatnot were still in progress so it could be a bit later than that we played a little bit of uh, Sparklight, which is this um, 
indie Zelda-like game. Again, pixel art, pretty charming stuff like that. They had like, you know, daisies in the in the grass, just like looked almost exactly like the daisies that you see in the grass in Legend of Zelda: Link to the Past. It's pretty charming little game. You've got a couple of the mechanics like you can, you know, shoot range attacks that chart, you know, refill over time. You know, you got like a charge up hammer attack and you've got your normal swipe attack. But what's kind of cool is that the name of the game is named after Spark Light, which is the resource uh, in the game that everybody wants. And you can spend that on upgrading buildings and, you know, creating structures and, and different uh, buildings and, and utilities in the city that is kind of like your hub for the game. So you kind of like go back to your city whenever you die, or I, I'm assuming you're just, you know, at different intervals of the game. And you, whenever you do, you can spend your spark light to upgrade and add to your, your setup there, which is pretty cool. And then you can launch back into the world and play some more. And yeah, it had some interesting mechanics. The, the build I played was a little rough. You know, they had some issues, especially because it was apparently the PC, the PC version was just fine. I spoke to the marketing guy. He said that there was just a, some issues with that particular build for the, the Nintendo Switch that they were on display with. You know, frame rates, uh, some some splitting of tiles and whatnot, and uh, you know, long load times. But I'm sure that'll all be fixed by the time the game's ready because it's pretty obvious. But um, overall, really enjoyed it. Very charming, and one of those kind of games. You're like, hey, I kind of want to go back and play that. So that was uh, Sparklight. I believe it was releasing this summer, if I remember correctly. Um, I played a little bit of Fade to Silence. It's published by THQ Nordic. Um, they've got a lot of great games in their booth. You know, they had obviously Pathfinder and Kingmaker. They they have their Warhorse Studios, you know, game and DLCs, uh, Kingdom Come and stuff like that. This one was kind of a newbie. I, I wasn't sure about it, and I, I saw it, and I thought it was some sort of, like, modern horror game just from the artwork I saw. But then I played it. I saw the demo for a couple days, and I'm like, that looks kind of interesting. It's like fa fantasy, almost like... Kind of, when I looked at it, it was like, this is almost like... A, a Night's Watch simulator in uh, Game of Thrones. It kind of, you know, they had like very big burly, you know, uh, fur cloaks, you know, walking through the, you know, blizzardy snow and mountains and stuff like that, looking for, you know, survival to, you know, wood and food and things like that. So I was like, this is really cool looking. So I got to try it this morning and uh, I love the concept. I really love the concept. Unfortunately, there were some kind of pressing issues here and there. Um, has sort of an interesting combat system. Um, uh, I hate to sound like a plebeian, but it, it kind of felt a little bit like Dark Souls-y, kind of like light attacks, heavy attacks, heavy animations. I mean, it didn't seem like it had any particular other flavor of combat. Um, it didn't have like a free flow combat that I saw, you know, where you can like dodge and parry and stuff like that. It's pretty much just like attack, light attacks, heavy attacks, things like that. Um, Enemies kind of had a uh, fairly, you know, you could kind of add tells and their animations and stuff like that. It wasn't, I don't think it was nearly as intricate as, say, Dark Souls, but it was kind of leaning toward that kind of sort of combat from what I could tell. Um, really cool, some kind of cool, uh, you had an encampment that you could, you could recruit new uh, people into. You know, when you find new people out there, you can try to recruit them into your encampment. Um, you could also have to find supplies and stuff in your encampment. Like, I was on a quest to find some wood. Um, very kind of atmospheric, snowy, kind of frosty wilderness sort of thing. And what was really cool is that you can actually, um, you have got stamina, so if you run, you don't run too far and you kind of run out of stamina, but uh, you could call in like your dog sled, where you had like these kind of cool wolf looking dogs, and your sled, and you can actually use that to traverse without uh, burning up your stamina. So it was actually really fun, kind of just like go mushing your, your dog sled around the, the snowy wilderness there for a while. I really like that aspect. Unfortunately, that's when I first started seeing some really kind of. I mean, this is obviously pre, you know, pre-release footage, so any anything could change. But um, I kept on getting flipped over, physics kind of getting, you know, the dogs getting stuck, or the physics kind of getting wonky. So I had to like resummon the the dog sled and stuff like that. So hopefully, they can get those issues uh, worked out by release. Um, another issue I I realized. I mean, this game obviously wasn't made, you know, by it didn't seem to be made by native English speakers. You know, maybe people by that had a, the English as a second language. So the writing was like, like the game took its world very seriously, and there were some kind of genuinely creepy moments. You know, like there's this kind of weird, there's like corrupted lands with like you know, this kind of red tentacles coming up, and there's this kind of 
weird kind of beating heart of corruption that you had to kind of, you know, semi-corrupt yourself to destroy some evil being talking to you uh, kind of in your head while you're doing all that. All cool stuff, I, I dug that, but the writing quickly, in the, at least in the demo, quickly deteriorated in that aspect. It was very... It was like, I, I wish I remember, I, I almost wanted to write down the exact line, but there was a line from this evil demonic force saying like, you know, why are you always, you know, why are you always stopping my my plans? I'm going to squish your guts out or something like that. It was very, very like, almost like a Saturday morning cartoon level kind of cheesy. And I just, I, I felt it kind of clashed with what, what it seemed like a very kind of serious, you know, if it was kind of tongue in cheek and kind of over the top. You know, Saints Row, obviously, like, you know, it's another uh, th famous THQ property. Um, I don't know if Nordic owns that or not, but um, that obviously was very ridiculous, so it didn't really matter what they said. But this game kind of took itself seriously, so to see that kind of, like, hear that kind of, you know, B-movie, B cheesy dialogue, it kind of took me out of the experience. But, uh, yeah, there's some sort of evil demonic possession that uh, can actually take the take hold of the minds of people and they'll attack you and stuff like that so yeah i didn't get that far into the game and then just the demo but um i had positive and negative things about it but i hope it does but fix those issues and, and ends up being a good game it just kind of seems like it's one of those games like oh man there's some great ideas and great aspects in here but they didn't quite you know work out the kinks but hopefully that works about better i recommend checking it out though if it interests you fade to silence Another kind of surprise thing, I just walked past it for, for the first time here on Sunday, uh, was called Night Call. It first struck me as a detective game, and I asked the guy there, and he said, yes, it's kind of like that. And I started playing it, and there was a lot of dialogue, a lot of um, exposition, things like that. So I was like, oh, is this kind of a visual novel? Um, and at the beginning, it kind of felt a little bit like a visual novel. It was very linear. You could answer a couple of questions, but it kind of, sort of kind of took its own course. Very striking. It's all black and white, completely black and white, kind of noir. Um, you're, you... The way it starts out, at least in the demo, I don't know if there's a, you know, this is going to be the exact way it starts out in the final game. You wake up from a coma, and people saying, like, you know, uh, you know, are you okay? Are you all right? And you find out that you were um, the only surviving victim of this serial killer called the Judge. And uh, apparently the Judge targeted you and your passenger inside of your taxi, your taxi driver. Um, and they killed the passenger, and... You were very badly hurt, but you you were, you know were induced into a coma, but you only woke up, and so you're kind of like the only living you know victim essentially of this guy or girl, whomever it is. You don't know, um, but you uh, early on after you get out of the hospital or whatever, you uh, are then essentially blackmailed by some a somewhat cavalier, almost like semi crooked cop who's basically. Uh, blackmailing you with some of your history, your past history that would look really bad, make you seem kind of highly suspect that you might actually be the killer. Uh, blackmailing you, she doesn't think that you're the killer, but she's willing to uh, blackmail you and turn you in as a as a as a high, you know, likelihood of be, as being the suspect, unless you cooperate with her and basically put your feelers out and run the streets and stuff like that and kind of get information that she cannot easily, you know, uh, collect. And if you do that, then she'll basically let you off the hook. So she's basically blackmailing you in order to investigate the killers uh, and, you know, get information that would lead to his arrest. So interesting plot. And then the actual gameplay kind of drops you into this kind of semi taxi simulator. It's kind of weird. Uh, you see like this big, it's all set in, I think, uh, Paris or, or somewhere in France. Um, and it's all in English, but uh, you can tell it's probably localized from, from French. There's still a couple typos and stuff like that. They'll figure that stuff out. But uh, kind of as a very kind of French, interesting European vibe to it. Uh, very noir. Um, but you'll actually get this whole map of the city and you'll see different locations like gas stations and stuff like that. And you can actually drive to the gas stations. It almost looks like a kind of like a weird noir um, Google Maps, essentially. So you actually see, uh, you know, your arrow heading toward the different streets and, and going to the gas station and you can like pick up magazines, read newspapers, talk to the people, get your feelers out that way. But then there's also uh, potential pickup, you know, pickup targets, you know, people that you can uh, essentially, you know, uh, people wanting to hire you, you as a taxi. So you can go to them, pick them up. And then there's a whole story with that person as you're driving them somewhere. 
one thing I thought was really cool is there's actually sort of an uh, interesting ambiance where it actually shows your screen of like your kind of darkened profile of the, of the taxi driver and in the back the person talking to you it's the focus is on them but in the back you'll actually see like a sort of abstract uh, 3d rend uh, model of the city moving as you're driving so it isn't just like a, a 2d cinematic when you're driving it actually shows like the a 3d version of the google maps that you're actually traveling through it's kind of weird really really interesting uh visual style you know a combination of uh, obviously 2d you know hand-drawn digital painting artwork and like a 3d background as and it actually you're actually making the real turns you're making in the, in on the map so that was actually a really cool detail um you actually see your guys making turns and things like that that you're making turns in the actual game world and there's a lot of uh you know i, I played through a couple of the rides and some pretty hard he heavy uh heavy hitting stuff I, i'm usually if writing isn't very good i usually kind of like I'm kind of burnt out on it because I, I kind of have a, like a almost like three unwritten rules of game writing. Either it's really good, it's voiced, or it's short. You know, like it, you, if it's neither of those, then you know I don't like it. But this wasn't super verbose, but it was actually pretty good. I was actually kind of getting invested in some of these people and their struggles and stuff. It wasn't too, hey, look at how cool my writing was. It was actually pretty, pretty. Uh, fairly heavy hitting which i was actually surprised about so um it does look kind of like 60 60 70 percent visual novel but it looks like there is some simulation aspects in there too very mild but some simulation aspects that you actually get like you get paid fair when the person completes their taxi ride you uh you know spend money filling up your car at gas stations and stuff like that i'm assuming there's other there's other aspects of money management and, and other things like that in there too it's pretty simple but does add a, add a bit more gameplay aspect to it, you know. It, it's kind of like if uh, Papers Please didn't have your end of the workday, you know, got to pay rent, got to pay heating. Oh, I can't feed my kids today. They're gonna get sick. They're not, they're gonna die, kind of thing. Like if it didn't have that, I think Paper Please would kind of feel less of a game, you know. But the fact that it has that aspect to it too, the kind of you know somewhat simulation aspect to it too, kind of helps it flush it out as more of a game, which I, I kind of appreciate. So yeah. That seems definitely interesting. I'd like to see it uh, closer to release. It's called Night Call, which uh, definitely seems interesting. But otherwise, I, was, I think that's about everything I saw today. Um, yeah, from, uh, it was a pretty, pretty short day. I had, I had a meeting I had to go to, and then um, yeah, otherwise just checked out some some cool tabletop games. Got to uh, go to the Game Right booth there, which they have every, pretty much every year. And try out some of their games and actually I've done this twice now I've actually gone to the game right booth and and uh, talked to the I think it's their uh, lead um, research and development guy there uh, Jason and he actually shows us you know prototypes of games we're able to look at those games and and like various steps sometimes they're like literally just like scribble and paper sometimes they're uh, you know designed and printed but you know are missing a manual so there's like a prototype manual or various other stages, but yeah, I've done this a couple times, and it's actually really cool prototyping different games and stuff like that. Got to try a game out today, um, today, and it was actually really fun. Um, and he was kind of like testing us to see if we could figure it out without, you know, having the final printed manuals and stuff like that. So it was actually pretty cool because we had to we had to figure the game out completely with unfinished materials uh, while he kind of inspected us uh, and looked at our. You know our reactions or things we were kind of confused by things were kind of ambiguous and stuff like that so it's really cool they, they really put a lot of effort into um making sure the experience is smooth and seamless and people don't get hung up or confused by rules or whatever and stuff like that i mean toward the end he kind of interjected like oh yeah by the way you know that or whatever and usually it's rules that we actually read and understood but we forgot but uh yeah it was really really interesting i i love seeing i mean a lot of people are usually either board gamers or video gamers, but there's actually a lot of parallels between them in terms of raw mechanics, you know, things like that. So the, the obvious advantage of video games is video games can kind of play themselves. You don't have to have a gigantic tutorial necessarily for a video game to work, especially if it's a fairly simple one. With board games, you have to do all the mechanics and all the rules. You know, the, the game board can't roll the dice itself. It can't move your piece itself. It can't, you know, spit out gold coins onto your lap. You know, it has to... Act. You actually have to know when when to take things and when to do things so you have to have a much 
deeper understanding of the game than you would necessarily of a game, say, like when you play Diablo or something like that, the game's figuring out all the, all the stats, all the mechanics, all the resistances and stuff like that. If you're playing Dungeons and Dragons, you have to actually calculate all that stuff. You have to know the rules. Oh, this is, doesn't, you know, this doesn't reflect that. This has a, you know, so-and-so save. This has, uh, you know, your resistance is this, this, and this, and a, and a plus a d20. So board games require a lot deeper knowledge of the player to be able to play it quickly. So I, I find that interesting. And, and yeah, trying out new games and prototyping them and stuff like that is really cool. So I spent uh, a bit of the day doing that and just relaxing. And like I said, my foot was pretty swollen still. So getting off my feet there was a was a, a godsend. So um, yeah, hopefully you found this interesting. Um, this is my first time as a media uh, representative at PAX. So still kind of learning, you know, scheduling and stuff like that. I got a lot done the first day or so, kind of hit a bump there on, on Friday, but I think we've got a, uh, quite a bit done. There's still probably half a dozen games I wanted to check out, but, um, you know, you, you got you to pick your battles, so yeah, we'll see if this happens again. Um, yeah, but otherwise, I hope you really enjoy the video. I really enjoy checking out these new games, and I, I love uh, putting the word out for some of these indie titles that, you know, may be a little bit under the radar from some people, so by all means, check them out. I'll try to link all of the games of note that I... Uh, talked about here in the video description and yeah hopefully you have a great day guys thanks so much for watching i'll see you later